Can everyone do this? Can everyone do this? Yeah, come on. Excellent. I'm truly delighted uh, to see you all joining us once again. Uh, and thank you uh, to our friends from ISH's extended uh, community who have also tuned in today. Uh, it's going to be an interesting session for all of us. Uh, I'm certain uh, you will be uh, fascinated by her energy, her astuteness, uh, and her sheer presence today. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce you to the true diva of Italian cuisine and a dear mate of mine, Ritu Dalmia. Uh, Thank you. Ritu, a little bit, uh, let them also know. Ritu is a workaholic chef owner of several Italian restaurants and a catering arm. But to date, believes that there is nothing as satisfying as seeing customers leaving her restaurants happy. Uh, she carries her passion on her sleeve, much like me, I do the <laughs> same. And it's quite evident when you dine in her restaurants, uh, you will find, in fact, a bit of Ritu in all aspects of the dining experience. Uh, for me uh, and for everyone, she's a trailblazing icon for feminism and loved by her fans and well-wishers all over the world. This one's for you, Ritu. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. But, but before we begin the session, uh, a quick question for you, Ritu. Uh, yeah. You travel literally 300 days of the year. <laughs> okay, viewers, at the moment, no. Us, at the moment, no. <laughs> so how does it feel to be at home for 40 days? Okay, so you know, life, everything in life has various phases whether it's emotions, something new. And for me, this five weeks that I have been in one place, I think the first time in 30 years of my life uh, that I have been in one place for five weeks and maybe four more weeks. So it starts with anger. Okay, the first stage is anger. What the hell is happening and why am I stuck and this is not okay, I need to go back to my restaurants. Second is frustration. Okay, there's not much I can do about it. Uh, you know, what the hell? Third is depression. And then you say, okay, I give up. Life is shit. What, why is it happening to me? What have I done? Forget about what's happening to the rest of the world. We are only feeling sorry for ourselves. And thankfully, I am in the fourth stage, which is a stage of acceptance and making the most, you know, the best of it. So what I've been doing for last 10, 15 days, I've started working on a new cookbook, which was long overdue. My publishers, I think, will be thrilled because for last three years, I've been giving them goli that next year, next year. So uh, secondly, what's, I think, more than anything else that's happened to me is my love for food has come back. And I hate to say it, and I should not admit it, and especially because your students are watching it, but the whole reason why I got into a restaurant or becoming a chef was because I loved to cook. I loved to cook and to feed people. Over the years, I still loved it, but it became also a chore. You know, it became all also about food costing. It came about uh, menu plannings. It be became about catering menu plannings, experiences. So it became like a job. Here for the last five weeks, I'm all alone. There's no staff. There's no one here. So I've also realized I have amazing skills as a dishwasher, as a iron wala, dhobi wala, poncha, jhadu poncha wala. But I'm cooking. I'm cooking food which I used to eat when I was a kid. I love Gujarati food. It's something which is my all-time favorite meal. But I've never cooked it so every day there's something or, and i'm stealing food because for many weeks as i told you in goa there were no ingredients available and no fresh ingredients so you had your dal you had your chawal and no fresh vegetable no dud dahi so i would go around my house pick up green mangoes steal jackfruit steal breadfruit and cook from what's available and the fun and the thrill of cooking is back so in some ways i hate to admit this whole COVID has happened to the world. So I could rediscover the joy of cooking. So nice, so <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, my, my dear students, you please have to wait. They're they are flooding you with questions. 
Uh, I, that's the best so way to do it. No, their, their <laughs> chance will come. Ch I got another question, girl. I got another question. <laughs> I, have a, I have one more question. Uh, yes. Uh, tell our viewers, uh, why did you choose Milan for your restaurant in Italy? Okay, so I don't know if you know uh, much about my career, but in 1995, I opened a fine dine restaurant in London. It was one of the first fine dine modern Indian uh, restaurant in London. That time, the only restaurants that existed in Indian scenario was either the, uh, what do you call the curry and the lager, or there was Chutney Mary's of the world, or the Bombay uh, Brasserie, which was very traditional Indian. It was really what Indian accent is today. But unfortunately or fortunately, at the end, of course, it became a success. But I really had a very difficult three years of my life when I opened it. I was 24 year old. I didn't have enough money. Everything I had was invested. Some so new to the uh, English palate. I mean, everyone was wondering why I don't have vindaloo and chicken tikka masala on the menu. Uh, so when the time came for me to think about opening internationally again, everyone told me London, New York, these were the first two cities people would talk about when you think about an international destination. But the thing is, I'm an attention seeker. I've always been an attention seeker. Mezza Luna, it was the first Italian restaurant in Delhi. So I got the, how shall I say, the thrill of it to be the first part of it. But it was a failure. So the lesson I learned was, don't be an inventor, be an innovator. So for me, choosing Milan was very simple. Number one, I wanted undivided attention. I wanted to be not the first, but let's say just when the market is ready to jump in. I didn't want to compete with 1,500 other restaurants, which are there in London and New York in the Indian cuisine. I wanted to be... That was the first thing. Second, of course, was I was an Italian in my last birth. So when it came to opening an international restaurant again, for me, of course, Italy was the first choice. And in some ways, it was a very good decision, if I may say so, because Milan, after the Expo in 2014, changed completely. Today, you have better restaurants than London. The rents are half of one pays in Delhi. It's very cosmopolitan. People eat out four to five times a week. Of course, I'm talking everything pre-COVID times. But it's really, and in two years, the success that we've had in Milan, after opening Chittamani, we opened Speaker and we also bought in a Michelin star restaurant called Viva. So in two, two and a half years from one restaurant, we have very easily and successfully managed to become three. So I think I took a... Uh, chance, listen to my guts, and, and somehow it is. Uh, young people are more adventurous with food when it comes absolutely. to Absolutely. See, yeah. you see, Italians and Indians, there's no, not much of a difference. You know, you, an Indian travels, two days later, he wants his dal chawal, kadi chawal, or alu paratha, achar. It's the same. Italians, by the end of the day, they're very conservative eaters. They, if, so the same restaurant, if I had opened in Rome, it wouldn't have worked. But Milan, because it has such a huge expat community, because it has such an international community, and Italians who are working around the world, their palates are a lot more evolved, and they're a lot more adventurous, let's say, than the rest of Italy. I appreciate you giving a peek into your life, Ritu. Uh, thank you. Genuinely, uh, for my being pleasure. Part of uh, the ISH's digital community, yeah. um, I'm going to hand over this screen now uh, for a little uh, boost to my colleague uh, Rajiv Gulshan. He's our dean okay. and the moderator for this session. And I'm going to be uh, uh, seeing you on the other side of your session. Okay. Super. Look pleasure. forward to it. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thanks, Kanal. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, Ridu, uh, the process, like we discussed earlier on is going to be that uh, you're going to be uh, giving us a little bit of uh, peek into your life and uh, then we are going to open the questions uh, to the to, to our participants and participants know the rules uh, please raise your hands and i would uh, allow you one by one there might be a few questions which i might be asking on behalf of some people who have already been emailing me they've not been from this uh, too and i look forward to this interaction Super. For this one. okay thank you 
so hello everyone uh, what shall i say a peek into my life suddenly that sounds so mysterious so glamorous i wish uh, i had some uh, secret spy stories to tell you or my previous life when i was a detective or something but my life's really an open book so uh, as you all know i'm sure you do or you must have heard about it i'm not a trained chef and that for me is also my biggest strength i to be in marble business but i always used to cook i used to cook because my mother was a terrible cook and every time she cooked and my friends would come over i was a laughing stock so what i used to do is i started cooking and telling my friends that my mother had cooked them that meal so that it would save me embarrassment but i never really thought i will take restaurants or being a chef as a career that wasn't my plan my plan was to be this fancy rich business woman with two private jets standing behind one secretary holding a pink mobile phone going to wharton business school but uh, you know what we want and what life gives us are two different things altogether i started working with my father and that would have been the perfect step in the ladder for me to really become the so called tycoon and industrialist and few months later i realized i didn't have it in me i was not ruthless i was uh, which you need actually to some part you have to be a little bit hard in your uh, decision making and i realized i liked my life too much so one day my father shouted at me in front of my entire team that i was useless and not doing well i think i was 20 that time and i realized hang on i've had enough i'm not going to do anyone's ji hazuri and i shall do something on my own now what do i do i hadn't finished school i hadn't gone to college i had no qualifications the only thing i knew was uh, how to cook how to cook which i thought was how to cook but uh, not necessarily what everyone else thought was good so it was a spur of moment when i said okay i quit anyway my father was only paying me 2000 rupees month that day but i was very clever i used to uh, sell marble for him and i started taking commissions from him on that so at that time i had 265000 rupees this was 1992 or 93 and i thought i was the richest woman in the world i could retire i had 263000 rupees so what am i going to do i'm going to open a restaurant and that was the beginning of my first restaurant called mezzaluna so i am still very proud to say in days today 20 years later 25 years later restaurants need a crore a crore and a half to open i opened my first restaurant with 276000 rupees 263 i had and 9000 rupees i had to borrow secretly from my mother mezza luna was before its time it did not work uh, people used to come and ask me why is the smoked salmon cold why don't i have macaroni with baked beans on the menu and how dare i price a cheese fondue at 240 rupees but i have to admit it was one restaurant which still has the fondest memories for me it was the first one in delhi but it didn't work i found someone who bought it off me and here i was thinking i am such an amazing chef but this country does not appreciate me so i will go and open a restaurant in london now as i said i think my mother dropped me on my head when i was born because i mean at 20 okay. i want to open a restaurant which doesn't work yeah. and rather than looking at what i did wrong or what i did not know i just decide that okay the country does not appreciate me so i will open a restaurant in london without having a clue of how much it costs what never in my life i have to admit have i done a market study or i've done any statistics or done a business plan even now it doesn't work and i have to admit it has worked for me always so here i go straight into my rice boats banana boats uh, tell my parents i'm going for work i didn't even tell them that i'm planning to move there they had no clue i arrived there and i tell them i'm not coming back so i had this money which i had sold my restaurant for and decided to open a restaurant in kings road chelsea which was the most chichi most fancy area of london and within one week the reality hit came in hang on you have no clue you don't have enough money 
and uh, this is going to be a disaster. But there's a God who was watching over me. I found a business partner, restaurant open. Three months, someone would come, put a gun on my head. I would sign a check to the supplier, knowing it's going to bounce back like a rubber band. And then one fine day, there was a food critic by the name of A.L. who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. I think he was really one man who in some ways changed my life because he gave a review uh, to Vama, our restaurant there. And he never used to give reviews to Indian restaurants. He used to hate Indian restaurants. And that restaurant from one day sale of thousand pounds a day, our sales went up to 10,000 pounds a day. And I think, as I said, I'm still very grateful to him. So the restaurant is working. Soon I have people like Brian Adams, people like Mick Hucknell, Andrew Lloyd Webber, the Who's Who, Martina Navritilova, all eating at the restaurant. But I was homesick. I was homesick. Plus, I was in love with a woman at that time who was in India. And I had not accepted my sexuality at that point. So I was in between the things. So... I had decided the day the restaurant becomes successful, I'm going to come back to India because I couldn't come back before. I mean, first I had a disaster called Mezzaluna. Then I go away to London and try to open a restaurant. And I mean, I couldn't go wrong third time. So finally, when Mezzaluna was a finished story, Vama was on its feet, I decided to come back to India, which was in 1999. And what many people don't know is they think that as soon as I came back, diva happened. But uh, that's not entirely true because I'm really a wheeler dealer, actually, truly speaking. And uh, in between, when I came back, my idea was not to open diva because for me, the memory of Mezzaluna was still very fresh. It was about a city which did not know Italian food, which was not ready for Italian food. So I decided to open a brewery. As I said, uh, something wrong with my head. Bought the equipments, took a joint venture with Stala Arthwa. And three months down the line, I went to a restaurant in uh, Kailash Colony, I think it was. A Lebanese restaurant. And the food was terrible. It, I was with a few friends. And of course, I was being this uh, cocky, arrogant woman saying, oh, this is not hummus. It has no tahina in it. This falafel has no coriander roots in it, blah, blah, blah. And my friends turned around and said, if you really think you know so much about food, then why don't you open a restaurant? I think I was drunk that night and I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And next day, the brewery plan was all cancelled. I sold the machinery, gave up the joint venture and Diva started. And of course, post that, rest is history. It was good timing, right timing. When Diva opened, Delhi had changed, India had changed. Between 93 and 1999, a uh, lot had changed in India. People had opened the money, financial markets had opened up. You could travel easier. People were more exposed to food. So God was kind, timing was right. And Diva, so for, when I think about it, I may have had Mezzaluna, I may have had Vama. But if I was to think about my career, where it started, I would still say it was Diva. So that's about uh, the part, of course, from Diva. Um, I get bored very easily. So Italian food happened, restaurant happened, got settled in. What to do next? Let's do a modern bistro. International food, doesn't matter where it comes from, with good prices. Then happened Latitude. Then we did Cafe Diva. Then, okay, I turned 40. Now I know enough about Italian food and I've been told at 40 you need to learn a new language. So what do I do? I said, okay, I will teach myself Asian food. That's how Diva Spice to open. And as Kunal uh, spoke to you and told you before, then, the, you know, under, this restlessness came over all over again. And Milan happened, which was in 2016. And here I am in 2020, sitting in Goa, in a lockdown, cooking my khichdi, dal chawal, and happiest in the world. So, who knows, next restaurant, maybe home cooking, or an Indian restaurant from our homes. So, this is it. This is our, what I would say, one would really, um, uh, this is the path of my career so far, but still a long way to go. I'm still young, hip, and happening. So, I am sure in five years' time, when we have another session with you guys, when you all are all chefs, and hospitality 
guests tell us, I will have many more stories to add to it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful, Ritu. I have one couple of questions, follow on questions from what you just told us. Yeah. So, I've, I've obviously had some uh, interaction with Andy myself, but there's a lot of difference between Andy's approach to food and yours approach to food. So, how did it work out together? And what do you think uh, helped you to, at that time, to go to a foreign country? Well, uh, if I'm really honest with you, it didn't work out for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, with me and Andy, didn't, but that's bygones. So yeah. uh, it really didn't work out for me. And that's why I came back to India. And actually, I'm very grateful to him because uh, if I hadn't opened Bama, yeah. because it was so difficult, it was so difficult and there was really no support from anyone else. That's I right. wouldn't have learned what is restaurant business all about. So yeah. I really sold that restaurant for very little money uh, with actually much lesser than my investment. But it taught, it was my Harvard Business School for restaurants. So it's not about the approach, really. It was uh, a completely different way of working. Yeah. So my way of working has always been a very hands-on approach. I've always been that if I know my product well, no one else can mess around with me. So yeah. first, I need to learn it before I can command it to someone. As I said, it's a long, long, old story yeah. now. So, so uh, obviously the time really that you changed. have moved back I mean, in London, the Indian food has come uh, to a different level to a large extent. The number of people doing now home style cooking and um, have yeah. changed it from cheap and cheery curries to the most expensive. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so do you, do you think you were a little bit too early for that time? Uh, we were, I was too early. Definitely 95 was too early. But we also saw some how should I say benefit of it? I sold that restaurant in 2002. By 95, when we opened, it was too early. By 98, 99, it had already started picking up. But unfortunately, as I came back yeah. home in 1999, and after that, the restaurant just, you know, uh, unfortunately wasn't managed too well. But saying that, I mean, for me, uh, I go to London very often. I've seen the food culture there and I think they have better Indian restaurants than what we have in India itself. But London would never be a destination where I would open a restaurant ever again. Because yeah. as I said, the rentals, the work permits, the uh, overhead costs, it's Probably not worth, it's not yeah. worth my time and effort. Yeah. So uh, if I may ask, so which is, uh, what are some of your best or favorite restaurants in London, Indian restaurants in London? So I like Dishoom. I yeah. really like Dishoom because it's fun. But yeah. when I want serious food, it's always Amaya. I yeah. still think the Namita Punjabi and Kamilya Punjabi, what they have done with Indian food mm. uh, is, it's commendable. For yeah. me, they are really, two people are really admire for, mm. not only because I said, because of food at Amaya or, uh, masala zone or whatever the concepts that they have come but today really they are the mommies of Indian food in London. Uh, yeah. Jim Khanna very nice yeah. like it as I said the variety and the flavors they play with with Indian restaurants in London are not something that even one does in India but yeah. to be honest with you when I go to London I don't want to eat Indian food so yeah. unless they are uh, you know so, but as I said, let's see what will happen there also post-Brexit now when things change. I know, things will change. So you, yeah. had, uh, you had just mentioned about uh, uh, maybe uh, looking or contemplating opening a, a, a home-style food. So if I could ask you four dishes which, which, you would, which would be in the menu, what would they be? Ah, so def in the start, in the drinks, there will be definitely an Aam Ka Panna. Yeah. Okay, hundred percent. But done the Bangla way because we there's a Punjabi way of doing it, Rajasthani way of doing it, and what I've discovered, which is my favorite way, is the Bengali way where you actually roast the mango instead of boiling it. So yeah. it has a very nice smoky flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be handwo, there will be jackfruit rava fry, mm -hmm. and there will be uh, old fashioned khichdi. The really the heartwarming khichdi. Uh, there will be the Calcutta Lake Damalu. There will be the Orissa Vadas. So basically yeah. for me, when I talk about home food, I'm not saying my home food. It's yeah. going to be all the home food that I've liked from different regions. Put it in a cocktail shaker and there will be my menu. Yeah, that'll be awesome. I love Handu and I think uh, it's really underexposed kind of a dish. Not many people know about it. 
Correct. And uh, it is something which uh, which takes a lot of time and effort and ingredients. But uh, no, but actually, I disagree with you. You okay. see, I made handwo here when I had no vegetables. Okay, so that was the first time when I made handwo in Goa. Ingredient mm -hmm. was lentils and rice. Okay. okay, and the vegetables. Okay, normally they put uh, cabbage, loki, and carrot. In yeah. those days, I couldn't even get carrot, for example. Right. So I just put some torai, I put some cabbage in it, I put some sprouts in it, I put a canned uh, corn which was lying in my ladder somewhere for. And actually, the beauty of handwo is that you can more or less put anything and everything that you have. Yeah. So, ingredient wise, the only two ingredients that you need is dal and chawal. And you use one variety of dal only? So I actually used, when I was here, two varieties. Right. I could have used many. So I used the green moong and I used the chana dal because that was okay. the only dal I had right at that time. Sure, sure, sure. And do you normally finish it off with sesame and uh, sesame. sugar? So in the pan, you put the sesame, kadi patta, rai, hing, and fry it on both sides. And then you, yeah, okay. No, that's Correct. awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. great. It's good to hear these uh, well, not many people talk about Hanwo, so it was, I was quite yeah. excited to hear about it. Now, there's uh, some questions coming on my screen, so I might start asking you. Yeah, please. Things. So, one question is about uh, uh, at what age did you discover your passion as a chef, as a cook? And how did your parents uh, take to it when you wanted to go commercially into a food business? So, I was cooking my first meal. I don't know. I have a feeling there's a bit of exaggeration there. My mother insists that I cooked my first three-course meal when I was nine years old. I don't believe it. I could have been 10 or 11. Okay. But what she said, what I made was macaroni with yeah. carrots, a mole cheese, beans, eggplant baked together. That's and oh yeah, it sounds disgusting. So I'm very ashamed of it. But I've always liked to cook. So cooking for me, for the pleasure part of it, started very early. I used to steal money from my mother's bag to buy all the cookbooks of Tarla Dalal, which were the only cookbooks available that time, yeah. because I wanted to, and people used to go for movies. I used to sit and devour every cookbook that I could get hands on. My father used to travel a lot. My sisters used to ask for Levi's jeans and Wrigley's. My list used to be olive oil and pasta. But I never thought I will take it professionally or yeah. commercially. And saying, what did my parents think of it? Uh, my dear students, I think you haven't figured this out by now. I'm a very independent person. I always very independent person. I didn't ask my parents. I just informed them when it was all done. Okay, so there was no question of how did they take to it or whether they agreed to it or not. That's the way it was. Take it or leave it. My father did not speak to me for many months. He didn't even come for the opening. Uh, really? But for different wow. reasons. Wow. Good Marwadi girl will cook meat, uh, she will uh, pick up logo ka jutha plate uthaugi, logo ke order logi, meat ka paisa ghar pe nahi aayega. Those were the reasons. But later, much later in our lives, we used to fight a lot, my father and I. And thankfully, we made peace before he passed away. He had every newspaper cutting that ever came out awesome. in all the years of the restaurant. Yeah. So I have to admit, my mother was very supportive. As I said, she lent me 9,000 rupees also, the shortfall I had in the restaurant to open it. But um, as I said, they didn't have a choice. You yeah. know, you present it, you have to take it. And when, when they came to your restaurant for a meal, for example, in London or, or various places, yeah. Yeah. So you, do you, did you cook separately for them or were they fast? Absolutely you... not. So I told them I have a separate kitchen. Uh, which only cooks vegetarian food, but it was bullshit. But now they know about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you that because uh, I used to work in Calcutta, Roy Grant. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you and, had a separate uh, kitchen. Yeah, yeah. And that's but the... you are in Calcutta, which is a land of. You know, can you imagine if today's day and age, with the rentals that we have, with the social distancing that will happen, what will happen to have a separate vegetarian kitchen and a separate I think restaurants will cease to exist. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And that's why I think uh, everybody needs to think differently out of the box now. Uh, yeah. so we're also talking about, I uh, guess, uh, day for yesterday in a panel discussion with two chefs about how the restaurant um, uh, layout will change in terms of people seating. You know, would, yeah. would it just yeah. 100 covers? Yeah. 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 It's a completely different topic altogether.
lot to be debated there. And I think not only debate. I think a lot of us don't know what might happen. So nobody has. You see, right now it's all a guess. Yeah. Thing, but there are few things which I think will also be very good that will come out yeah. of it. And no offense meant to anyone uh, from the hotel industry per se. Yeah. I'm a control freak. I've always been a control freak. Uh, where hygiene is concerned, where cleanliness is concerned, where zero waste cooking is concerned. And today, I think somewhere, uh, people in our country don't take it so seriously. Also because our health laws and regulations are not so strict. There's no scare of closure, etc. So a lot of it is taken for granted. And this will have to stop now. And I think that's the only because today, following the FSSAI, following the hygiene, the cleaning, uh, the food temperature, the supply chain, this will become so, so important. Otherwise, businesses, it won't even be important. I think it will be mandatory. So yeah. first and foremost, all of us will need to change our attitude and our mentality. Because if and if that cannot be changed, they will not survive in this industry. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. I think it's more to do with the attitude. Uh, there's one more question here uh, yeah. in front of me, uh, Ritu, which I would like to put to you. Uh, it's about that if you had not been a chef, what would you have been? A DJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I have several. I have several um, alternative career, and I've been thinking a lot about it in these days. I can't sing to save my life. But I love music and I have a good year, you know, yeah. so I could have been a talent scout as well. Yeah. Because if I hear a new singer, I said, okay, this person has a promise. And sometimes mm -hmm. I wish I was an agent rather than a chef. I think I would have definitely been a richer woman. When I was younger, my other job thing, which I wanted to do was to open a bookshop. Mm -hmm. And the reason behind it was, can you imagine I will be able to read all the books in the world for free? Mm -hmm. I won't even have to pay for it. Yeah. So I think, uh, but DJ sounds like a cooler job. So yes, yeah. definitely a DJ, if not a chef. Yeah. So in terms of books, apart from cookery books, uh, what books interest you? What genre or what authors? So for me, I'm really um, greedy and not very picky. So yeah. anything I can get my hands on, I will read. So I read yeah. from everything from metaphysics to alternative reality to a third grade thriller to... Uh, murders and gore and to uh, philosophy, anything. So I like to read anything and everything that I get my hands on. And these days, I mean, unfortunately, my Kindle is not here with me. So I'm reading and rereading my old Agatha Christie books. Okay. okay. All the Mrs. Marple and Hercule Pora books. And okay. I don't even remember one plot how it ends. So yeah. it's a good yeah. exercise. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, that's awesome. Well done. So do you think this habit of reading has also uh, helped you in taking some uh, uh, decisions in your work? Has that kind of uh, influenced some of the things you've done? Of course. I mean, in many ways, I think, you see, I told you, I'm not an uh, educated person per se in what you would call in a regular sense. You know, I never went to a university or a college. But I've always read a lot and I've always traveled a lot. So whatever education I have, whatever knowledge I have, whatever mind that has opened up, which still has a scope to open up a lot, has been mainly because of books. So I still remember when I was 18 or something, I read a book called Heart of Sicily. It was a travel um, travelogue and a memory book, basically, with some recipes thrown in. But it was basically about this woman who ran a cooking school in a vineyard in Sicily. Right. That book touched me to a point that I can't even explain. Okay. And I decided I wanted to go there and learn how to cook Sicilian food. Mm -hmm. And that's really where my first technical knowledge of uh, my first real knowledge of Italian cooking came. Because I could imagine the tomatoes drying in the sun i could yeah. see the bread being baked i could see the landscape i could hear the dialect when i read the book yeah. and for me it was like the priority number one by hook or by crook i need to get there and spend some time there and in some ways that also helped me make the decision of becoming a chef sure, sure. So it's, it's amazing uh, some of these books can transform or take yes. a space which we've never been to 
Sure. It's so descriptive and writes so well that you actually feel you visited that place. Now, recently, I'm, I'm reading one of the questions that said that recently on Instagram, uh, you had put a picture of a breadfruit. And yes. have, you done, have you done something with it? That's one of the students wants yeah, to Yeah, yeah. So today only I did the breadfruit. It's there, uh, I think for lunch, I cooked myself khichdi with breadfruit. I think I must have already posted it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a follow-up question coming from the same person yeah. asking, uh, uh, what else can we do with breadfruit? And uh, what do you, how so, do you just So, say? you know, breadfruit is something which I love. It's something that I discovered. I have a home in Goa and I come here a few weeks in a year. And uh, so there's jackfruit, which is the sturdy, strong, uh, male fruit in my opinion and then there's breadfruit which is more elegant delicate uh, needs a lot better handling how you cook it so breadfruit is something I love so here locally what people do is they make like a rubber fry out of it which is just you know marinate it with salt turmeric like you would do a Bengali bhaja cover it with semolina and shallow fry it the other thing what I love to do with bread fry is actually make curries out of it. It's really nice in an Asian style curry with lemongrass, basil and Thai ginger. And today what I'm going to try, I don't know if it's going to work or not. I'm actually drying the rest of the bread food that I did not use because I want to make a flour out of it. Because it's supposed to have an ama- it's supposed to be an amazing gluten free flour because it has a huge starch content in it. So uh, let's see how that comes out with. But today, my dear student, whoever asked this question, uh, just remember one thing. You've got to let go. Any, you see a vegetable or a fruit, don't think, how can I use it? Anything and everything is possible. It's all trial and error. So, I mean, today I've done a bhaja with it. Why don't you do something with it tomorrow? Oh, no, you're in Delhi. You won't get breadfruit. I'm sorry. <laughs> so that'll have to wait for a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Ritu. Very well answered. Uh, there's one question uh, which talks about that. Um, would, you, would you recommend young budding chefs to travel overseas to gain experience? Or do you believe Absolutely. India has that potential? No. To- so I'll tell you, uh, I, for me personally, as I said, all my experience, whatever I've learned, it has happened with travel. So you see... I, if you want to, whether it's, forget about overseas or whatever, let's not talk about overseas or India. You need to decide what interests you. If Indian food interests you, regional food interests you, you need to go to that region and taste it at its source. Because what you taste at its source and what you taste from a recipe are two different things altogether. It's the same I would say with any international food. So if you like Italian food, you want to take Italian food as something that you would like to pursue, you need to be in Italy. And you don't like to be just in Italy. You need to be in a particular region because Italian food is also like Indian food. Every region has a different food. You want to do Thai, you need to travel extensively in Thailand and just not Bangkok and eat the food at its source. So I'm a true believer in that. In fact, most of the chefs in uh, Diva one of the biggest things uh, for us was always to give them an opportunity to travel. And we were very lucky to do a lot of international catering. So every international catering, we would take a lottery out of five, six chefs who would go uh, work in the catering and then stay back and do a stage in some restaurant or the other so they could actually see and taste the food at its source. So if you can manage to do that, I strongly recommend you do that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Shad, there's one more question that if we are, uh, if some of them want to open a regional cuisine or, um, uh, 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 or some international cuisine, they, one question will be asked as to how much should be the theoretical knowledge which needs to be uh, looked at and how much should be the practical knowledge. I think the practical uh, knowledge again, you're asking a wrong person. You're, for me, it's only practical knowledge that works. So you're really asking a wrong person. As I said, uh, First and foremost, you need to love that cuisine. Forget about theoretical and practical. First is you need to feel for that food. You, your mouth should water when you think about the dishes from that cuisine. Then, of course, as I said, you need to also know the ingredients. What are the special spices? What are the special different types of rice? Whatever it may be. That's the theoretical part. And practical, guys, without practical, all theories, anyway, a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so there's a, 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 I don't know if you, I think you've uh, cooked that ISS before and you would have placed that 50 the part is, uh, is uh, a lady chefs, uh, want to be uh, chefs. So there's one, I'm taking uh, great offense, Rajiv. What is lady chefs? All chefs are chefs. There are no lady chefs and no men chefs. This is the biggest problem here. Okay. You see, chefs are chefs. There are no, there shouldn't be a distinction between a lady chef and a male chef because at the end of the day, your talent and your skill is what talks for itself. But yeah. yes, coming uh, to your, yeah, sorry. Let me go complete ahead. my question, Chef. You, you yes. were just jumping down my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Give me, let, Come let on, me I have to show, um, I have to take my knives out once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah but <laughs> knives should be for the kitchen, not, not at picking at me. But I, I tell you, I got a bigger collection of knives, let me tell you that. So um, there is the question is that your energy is absolutely contagious and inspiring. But if somebody wants to open their own restaurant and they feel, if, oh, is there any point where you felt extremely low and how did you come out of it? So that's, no, sorry. So this is a question about lady chef or I didn't understand. So this is a so question about... So as a woman about, chef, yeah. you're saying, was it difficult to open a restaurant? Is yeah, that the question? So yeah. So I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I have never seen any form of prejudice or any form of difficulty being a woman in the kitchen. Uh, but that also really depends on the person to person. As I said, if you, I always tell this to all the women who work with me and uh, under me, is don't expect a different treatment than a male chef. You cannot be a hypocrite. If you want a man to open the door for you, if you want that, you know, you should be allowed to leave earlier because you're a woman, then also expect a different treatment as a chef in your kitchen, irrespective of your skills. So if you have that strength and that belief in your skill sets and your ambition, I don't think being a man or a woman really makes a difference because fortunately, this Career is about skills. It is about talent. It's about passion. It is not about what sex you belong to. Yeah, well, well answered. Thank you so much. Um, there's uh, one more suggestion about your breadfruit uh, from Chef Babu. He says you can also use it for knocking. Uh, Absolutely. Which, I'm a teetotaler. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I think what's happening is you have started a debate about breadfruit and I think uh, more about it's it. an amazing, amazing, amazing plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is uh, one question about uh, uh, the, if you have to cook for, for us, one person in this world, who would that? Oh, many, many, many. But uh, there was one. one person, let's say, who was alive right now. It would be an author called Janet Winterson. She's one of my all-time favorite author. Her books have made a huge impact on me. And if she would come and dine with me, I think I would, I think I'm very starstruck. I think uh, I would be super, that will be a real honor and a pleasure. And a person who is dead, if I was to cook for that person, I think it would be Mahatma Gandhi. I would make him handwork. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> And uh, uh, would you change any ingredient if you make it for him? Or why it's a shakahari gen, yeah. no dairy, perfect for yeah. him. Perfect for him. Yeah, <laughs> you have to replace it with goat milk. Yes. Uh, you, you, <laughs> you earlier mentioned something about uh, an author. Can you just repeat her name and tell us a little bit about her? Janet Janet Winterson. G yeah. J E A N E double T E. Winterson, W-I-N-T-E-R-S-O-N. So uh, she's a very well-known alternative uh, style of uh, author. Her first book was Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Uh, okay. She's written about 15 or 20 odd books. Brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. As I said, a little bit abstract. Also a lesbian author who also, as I said, in the early life when I read her books, it also made a very big impact on me. So she's really, I think, for me, my all-time favorite author. Yeah, that's great. There's one question about uh, if you were to go back in time and change something you did or a decision you made, uh, what would that be? None. Zero. I have no regrets about anything that I've done in my life. Awesome. I've had many ups and downs. I've uh, nearly gone bankrupt twice in my life. Uh, I've opened many restaurants, shut down many restaurants. 
but if i look back not even a single regret about because i took something out of each and every experience yeah that's awesome thank you uh one more question chef coming away from me we asked uh, 80 to 90 percent of the restaurants are not successful and close within the first year of operation and 10 to 20 percent uh do well top two tips of what what is required to run a successful restaurant so one most of two tips number one location make sure your location is absolutely the correct location don't uh, compromise on that and secondly remember you're not building your palace you're building your business establishment so make sure your capitals are as little as possible so as i told you before i've nearly gone bankrupt twice in my life i've opened many restaurants i've also shut down many restaurants and when you sell restaurant is not successful you will not get even a rupee out of your investment because yeah. there is no resale value for used tables chairs air conditioning equipment etc so for me what i've learned is to keep my capital to the lowest minimal possible so even god forbid i'm in the 10% which it closes down i will still be able to survive and secondly as i said you can have the best product and if you're in a wrong location you will anyway not work yeah yeah awesome thank you very much uh there's one thing which uh, one few students have written that we uh, we empathize with you about your parents because they've been living with the parents for 5 weeks now all <laughs> 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 you see, advice you see my nephew i have to tell you a very funny thing my nephew told my brother the other day i need some humans so he turned around and said, and what are we he said your parents you're not <laughs> humans so <laughs> <laughs> so my sympathies with all of you guys be patient be calm you know what iset should do is open another school for parents okay all parents i think should be sent to a school to learn a thing or two basic behavior how to behave with their children you know something uh, we all say that but once we become parents we we become yes. like our parents you yes. know that yes. i can talk that i got a 27 year old uh, son and a 19 year old daughter and i I sometimes think about how I interact with them and say, "Well, this is what my father used to do to me." And I yeah, like, you can't escape your genes. No, no, we can't. You know, uh, yes. there's a question around uh, a cloud kitchen. Uh, do you believe that uh, that's, that's a concept which would be uh, moving on? It has to. Right now, uh, you see, it's not as simple as cloud kitchen. The concept of cloud kitchen has been going around for a while now. Yeah. and especially now with post covid period i think cloud kitchens will take a bigger role than they ever have but it's just not about a kitchen it also means a supply chain and the logistics that goes with it to make sure that the cloud kitchen operates well and that's something we don't have as yet we yeah. still don't have it the way it should be but as i said this is a time everyone is inventing everyone is restructuring everyone is thinking out of the box so yes actually truly speaking cloud kitchen will be the way forward in future yeah so there's uh, another question uh, which uh, sandeep is asking around uh, uh, home actually home restaurant concept which she wants to open and she believes that uh, she wants to get a big haveli or a, a farm house uh, grow her own vegetables and uh, well i'll tell you it's a brilliant concept but the problem is in fact my first restaurant which i wanted to open was meant to be something like that a haveli in oscar's village but don't forget darling there are a lot of other issues like licenses which rules and decides where you open it so for example in a city like new delhi you can only open restaurants in commercial markets or places which have a commercial so a haveli a farmhouse will never get that license so you won't get your eating house license you won't get your alcohol license so uh, it's a great concept but for that the laws of this country needs to change a little bit before one can do that yeah yeah um so uh, one of my friends i don't know you might be knowing this restaurant called bray in uh, australia in melbourne yeah and he's running it out of a farm house and uh, yeah. fast yeah. it is the top restaurant in the world and uh, he he grows everything uh, he does has his own butcher shop in the farm house and draws all the vegetables there but like you said the rules and regulations are slightly different in australia yeah, yeah. killer yeah. can get over without a problem i mean that's yes allowed. exactly in fact uh, uh, if we prove that we have killed a kangaroo we can get 100 dollars from the government yeah okay <laughs> um there's one restaurant one uh, question about uh, um 
people need to after they like uh, students are doing a, a qualification and how, do, you, do you believe it will help them first to work in uh, working with a good chef uh, before they set up their own restaurant or you should just I it? definitely I definitely believe in fact someone asked me before is there anything that I regret or would have changed I lied okay I was lying when I said nothing yeah. because the truth is if I could change one thing what I would have loved to do is get some practical hands on experience in some restaurant yeah. before I went out on this career so yeah. guys you will have your theoretical knowledge you will have your technical knowledge but i strongly recommend go and work under a good chef go and get some practical knowledge see the dirty side of the business it's not all glamour and beauty and wonders and people sending you flowers because what a wonderful chef you are it's bloody hard work it is definitely not glamorous it is highly risky it's long hours it's exhausting and who knows after 6 months that you worked in a restaurant you may just decide this is not a career for you So please, please go get your hands dirty first before you go and venture into your own space. Yeah, uh, there's one uh, uh, comment from uh, one of the students, Nishant Dua. He's for five years he has been in graphic design, uh, and now he wants to get into food as his calling. Uh, but is obviously uh, uh, you guessed it is his father and his mother. They feel that you know you will be wasting five years of your time. Uh, so he he is wondering if he can give uh, your number to his parents. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'll give them a piece of my mind. <laughs> you know, but jokes no. apart. Look, uh, as I said, this is a strange time to talk about it. But the reality is, if you have passion and if you have talent, today uh, being a chef, being a restaurateur is also a very highly paid job. It's not that you're going to be uh, not earning enough or not doing enough. So, and the today, don't forget. it's not india of 25 years ago when i used to be asked by clients at the restaurant if i will come and work as a barbarchi in their home and they'll give me 20000 rupees salary and a room to stay things have changed now there is respect today you if you're a good chef you're an artist and today the country has started treating you like that so your parents should understand and if you need i will speak to them no problem at all uh that this is a very noble and an honorable profession so uh, and if you succeed in it as i said just go and reach for the skies you know absolutely thank you that was great great response uh, there is one question about uh, restaurant ownership uh, should they be if they want to open a restaurant should the students or what they are asking should they be looking for a person to put in the money uh, that's the right approach or should they be looking to first ah, okay. do up their so, skill sorry So I have seen most of the disasters happening in restaurant where a non-chef has put in the money who has no clue about the food part and a chef is a partner in terms of skill 99% it will not work okay either you get in an investor who has no say in the business it may still work but before doing any of it guys you all kids don't be in a hurry to go and jump and open your own restaurant tomorrow go get some experience if you are a good chef if you show some talent the place you are working they may just some put put some money in you and say that you run a restaurant for us and we'll give you some you know stakes in it but don't go in with people who say there are a lot of you see the biggest problem with restaurant business as i said before is people perceive this as a very glamorous business so there'll be a lot of people who will come say acha main paisa laga deta hu okay then they will be there and saying ye bhai minestrone mein na mirchi nahi dali yaar tune aaj mere guests jo aaye the wo complain karke gaye hain ki ye thoda sa you know mirch masala nahi tha and what will you do then flare up and say what the fuck have i got myself into so try to avoid that as much as possible is my little piece of advice to you No, no, that's awesome. That's awesome coming from you, uh, Kunal and Dilip. I I know that you are in the forum. If you would like to ask a question to uh, uh, Ritu, please go ahead. Hi, Chef Ritu. How are you? I'm <laughs> very well, Dilip. How are you? I'm good, as you can see, luxuriating with yes, the food. Yes, I know. I know. Uh, well, you see, I managed a haircut. You yourself? Know, sneak... No, 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 no. So you see, I'm very clever. I had sneaked out for a walk, and there was this girl who was walking as well, also stuck here. uh in the lockdown from bangalore and i was just messing with my hair and she says you need a haircut i said yeah 
He said, well, I don't live far from you. I'll sneak in one morning, give you a haircut, and you can give me a meal. So we did a barter deal. <laughs> I packed our lunch. And I got a haircut. <laughs> oh, I got to find somebody like that. Uh, so I was, uh, what, what an absorbing uh, uh, session, Ritu. I wish uh, it didn't have to end so soon. But I was listening to you talking about your early life. And I had two questions, both uh, funny yes. questions to you. Uh, you mentioned that in your last life, you were an Italian. What were you as an Italian in your last life? I mean, a mafioso. Yeah. What a silly question. I was the biggest mafia leader in Sicily. I was controlling all the wine and the booze and the grains, everything. Whoever gave and came and gave me a chadawa, food <laughs> will be given to them. Great. And, and then you mentioned something about your mother was a terrible cook. In all these years, have you tried to teach her to become a No, medicine? I've given up. I've given up. Okay. It's beyond, she's beyond repair. <laughs> uh, kids... Um, don't listen to Chef Ritu. Uh, please keep making efforts to try and get your parents to also learn how to cook. Thank you so much. Parents here on the line, I'm sure. I know, I know. No offense meant whatsoever, but for me, the greatest gift was my mother's bad cooking because that made me into a chef. Okay? <laughs> so I'm very grateful to her. Wonderful. Kunal, over to you. Lovely. You know what, uh, Ritu, uh, I was just listening in and, you know, this thought kind of came to my mind. If, if I was a casting director and I was Charlie, you would have been one of my angels, you know. All right. No, I'm sorry, Kunal. You cannot say that because Charlie is my role. I am Charlie. You could be one of my angels, but Charlie is me. All right. You know, I, I, I love you to Helen back. Seriously. <laughs> no, no, seriously, Ritu. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. You are, you are full of girl power. Uh, you see, Ritu. And before you go, you know what? Uh, we've not done this. And I'm just going to like a little break this tradition. We're going to give you like a 300 uh, ISH hand salute right now. Once again. Everybody wow. Give it up for Ritu. <laughs> Yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> oh, seriously, Ritu. Seriously. Thank you, know, you. You make our connections even stronger. You see? No, it's really a pleasure. It's really, really a been a pleasure. And, and hopefully in better times, I like to come myself again yeah. and do another session. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Right? From Thank all you. Of us, from all of us to you, big on love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.